Gallup did a poll in the late 80s of Americans and found out one out of 25 Americans has had a near, near death experience. That's, wow. that's like 13 million statistically. Yeah. This one guy, Randy, is a CEO. He has uh, embolisms in his, in his leg that travel up and block his pulmonary artery mm. and his body shuts down. And he, he rises up. Interestingly, he sees the realm all around us, the, the spiritual dimension all around us cries out to Jesus. Um, he was a believer in Jesus, but he was really struggling with God. And the next thing he knows, he's, he's up, he's traveling up and he's embraced. And he knows who this is. And he feels an arm around his stomach and he feels a beard on his face. <laughs> That's personal. And he knows this is Jesus <laughs> and he drops to his knees and he's just overwhelmed. And and Jesus turns him around and picks him up and he looks into his eyes and he said, you know, I, I knew love. I knew the love of a child. I knew the love of a spouse, but I'd never looked into the eyes of love itself. Gosh. And he said, I just never wanted to leave. All right, John Burke, all the way from Austin, Texas. Welcome to Houston. Great to be here, Eric. Dude, it's re been really good having you here. Um, you've been here all morning here. It's a Sunday for folks that are tuning in. Sunday afternoon now, mm -hmm. and you were with us all morning preaching uh, about um, these stories and this book that you've written um, for uh, three services yep. and uh, talking to folks afterward. How are you feeling? I'm good. I'm a little tired, but it's good. It's <laughs> yeah. all good. Man, thanks for making the trip. And um, gosh, the reaction from our people um, I mean, it was overwhelming. It was awesome. I'm a little jealous, a little, because they don't react to me that way, but I'm getting, I'm working through it. <laughs> Prophet's not welcome in his own hometown. <laughs> Maybe. That's, yeah. But it's so good to see people I care about so deeply just cut to the, cut to the core. But like I said, I'm, I'm jealous of your radio voice. <laughs> I don't have a voice like that. Well, I don't have a face like yours, dude. You just told, <laughs> you me, you're, told me you're 60 years old, man. I, I've, I've never looked as handsome as you do at 60. That's great. Oh, thank you. Well, we can be jealous of each other in different ways. The Lord can't give everybody else everything uh, right man it's uh it's really good to have you back we got to know each other back in 2018 yeah um when you had written a few years before that i think you had written uh, imagine heaven yeah which 2015 is, yeah and uh by 2018 we had gotten wind of it and we were getting started with this podcast about that time and um and, and we really just wanted to talk to you and you were open to that so we came to austin yeah and got to know you and talk to you about imagine heaven and near-death experiences, which we're going to get more into today. And But before we do it, you, you've written a follow-up book mm -hmm. because that one was, I mean, it was just such a breakthrough and for so many people to experience God through these stories. You wrote this book called Imagine the God of Heaven, which is on the same topic, but deeper. I've read both books. I frankly enjoy the second one more. I do too. Really? I do. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it's about God. Yeah. And, you know, like what so many near-death experiencers I interviewed said is of all the wonders, the beauty of heaven, the reunions of heaven, the, right. the mysteries of heaven, but nothing compared, nothing to mm -hmm. being in the presence of God. Yeah. And yeah. that's why I subtitled it, you know, the love you've always wanted, because that's what they would consistently say. Right. He is what you've always wanted. You just don't realize it yet. Dude, it's so profound. And the book itself is, is really, it's what I love about it is that it's a deeper dive mm. and theologically and just, just in, in any sense, I mean, it just goes deeper. Mm. And, uh, so I really, really appreciate it. I'm glad you wrote it and oh, I hope it does as well and even better than the first one. Oh, thanks. I know a lot of people are going to be, are going to be touched by it. So why did you choose to write a follow-up book on the same sort of topic, what was missing from the first one that you wanted to delve into more? Well, I mean, in Imagine Heaven, I touched on people's experience of God, but we didn't, we didn't really dive in. And right. what I'm trying to do in Imagine the God of Heaven, well, back up, funny little story. I actually quit writing after I wrote Imagine Heaven. Really? So you yeah. had written several books yeah, before? Yeah, I would written four books uh, and then Imagine Heaven. And as, as you know, I, my wife and I started a church that yeah. pastored for 25 years and, and, and the Lord had very clearly 
called me to do that. It was, it was clear. And, um, and I told him, you know, as you know, you've written some books. Mm. I told him, you know, I think I did what you wanted. It's too much to try to yeah. write books and, and lead people. Well, I, I'm going to do what you call me to do. I'm going to pastor this church. If you want me to write, tell me, but otherwise I'm done with that. Yeah. And so, yeah. So <laughs> imagine heaven it became a New York times bestseller and <laughs> sold like crazy. And I didn't write again, which, you know, yeah, usually you, you do. That's right. But, um, in COVID, the Lord made it really clear to me that, um, he did want me to write again and he wanted me to write about him, which was kind of like overwhelming, like, ah, uh, who am I? Right. But I, what he reminded me is, you know, it's not about me. I'm just a reporter. Mm. You know, he's, he's given me this kind of crazy, this is kind of crazy. I'll, <laughs> I'll admit it's kind of weird, yeah. Yeah. you know, like, but, uh, but an obsession for 35 years of studying these experiences and trying to reconcile them with scripture. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's kind of just the analytical geeky engineer <laughs> in me. I was like, sure. I got to figure out the answer. How yeah. does this work? And so, yeah. So he, he made it clear that I could pass a baton of leadership at gateway mm. and this is what he was calling me to. And so wow. we did last May. That's courageous. And, um, and you know, imagine the God of heaven just came out and yeah, it's cool. It's already, it's already a bestseller. And, oh dude. Amazing. And, you know, I'm, <laughs> it's, it's amazing cause I'm speaking on podcasts and things literally all over the world yeah. right now. Yeah. And I think that, I think that's the why because I think he wants people all over the world to know what he's doing. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's another motivation is I think he's raising up these stories. And as you know, in imagine the God of heaven, there's seven, 70 that, um, I've interviewed in, on every continent mm -hmm. and they are testifying to the same God, right? Even if that's not what was in their culture or in their religious background. Yeah. And I think he's showing that he's always been the God of all nations. Right. And yeah. And throughout scripture, you see like every nation, people in every place will lift up his name. And I'm not sure that made sense before we were so connected by technology. Like, um, I, I think yeah. about technology today being akin to like the Roman road system of the first century when, Absolutely. The, when the gospel spread on, you know, secular roads. Um, and without those roads, the gospel could not have spread the way that it did. And now we see the sort of um, the Internet superhighway kind of te technology making the advancement of the gospel even more possible. A book like yours wouldn't have been possible without that sort of connectivity. Oh, and and even five years ago, it wouldn't have been possible for, you know, the, the videos I showed you today yeah. of a guy in Rwanda and someone from India and, you know, yeah. all across the globe. And amazing. yet now you can go out and, and see these testimonies from all over the world. Right. But at the same time, what I'm trying to show is something I think is very important is that God didn't just all of a sudden show up in the age of modern medical resuscitation. Right. The same God who these people experience around the globe, he's been revealing himself throughout history all along. Yeah. And, and put it down through the Jewish prophets foretold what he was going to do through Jesus. And he wants to be known. Hmm. Yeah. I think that's a really important point. Um, because sometimes we can get caught up in sort of supernatural phenomena like NDEs, which we'll talk yeah. more in detail about in a minute and think, well, this is the end all be all. This is the true revelation. And and overplay that hand a little. And yeah. some people will, cynics will look at it and go, well, that they're claiming that it's, you know, um, the revelation of God. And, and I know that it's not. So I'll discount all those stories and both right. extremes are wrong. I've heard you say that these NDEs are an example of uh, experiences adding color mm -hmm. to what the Bible has already told us about the nature and character of God. And I really appreciate that sort of wording yeah. of it. Yeah. So um, before we get any further, let's kind of take a step back and make sure we're bringing everybody along with us because uh, I know your story and some folks listening might, but many don't. And so how did this all begin? Like, where did this uh, obsession or passion about NDA yeah. start? Yeah, for, for me, it started all the way back um, when I was an agnostic. I, uh, you know, I didn't know. I thought Jesus was probably just a legend. Mm -hmm. I mean, human, but turned into a legend, yeah. into God. 
um, I didn't know about God. I just, I had a lot of questions. You know, I ended up studying engineering, mm -hmm. the University of Texas and, you know, worked as an engineer. So I've always been analytical, quizzical, like why, how right. do you know? You know, that, that was always my angle and, and people couldn't answer my questions about God. And so I finally decided, well, maybe it's just not true. Yeah. And I'll just li li you know, live my life. And then my dad got cancer. Mm. And uh, someone gave him the very first book on research on near-death experiences. Mm. And I saw it by his bedside table, picked it up, start reading it, couldn't put it down. And by the end of it, I was like, whoa, this could actually be evidence. Like what I've been asking for. How yeah. do you know? This could be evidence that this this heaven God stuff might be real. Yeah. And so many of them talked about seeing this God of light. Some of them, Jesus knew he was Jesus. And so I didn't, I didn't become a believer, right. but I was open. Yeah. And then I, I started reading the Bible. I started asking my questions in groups and things like that. And, and then I finally came to realize for actually very different reasons than near death experiences that there is a ton of evidence that God has really revealed himself in history. Mm. And I weave that into the new book as well. I, you know, I had to my geeky self. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's interesting how far back that goes and, and how it wasn't an instantaneous sort of wholesale tra transformation that happened in you. No, like that book was sort of a breadcrumb along your trail. Yeah. And then I ended up, I worked as an engineer and lived out in Santa Barbara, California, which I didn't know until way later, but Santa Barbara ended up being kind of the place where a lot of research was taking place on near death experiences. This is really? in, in the eighties, huh. the late eighties. And so I kept running into them and I kept, you know, putting the pieces together. I actually gave my first talk on this in 1989 at the university of California, Santa Barbara. Wow. So I've been at it for 35 yeah. plus years and I've studied thousands of them now Dang. interviewed personally, hundreds and hundreds of them. Yeah. And I just think, I do think this is God giving testimony to his reality and yeah. his great love and grace offered to all people of all nations. Sure. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, let, let's sort of offer a definition for okay. near death experiences, because there's a wide range of different kinds of supernatural phenomena that sort of fit the bill, but might not. Like when I was six, I got what I still believe to this day, as skeptical as I am at heart, I, honestly, I'm a cynic about a lot of things, but I got this vision about a relative of mine who I'd never known, never met, but who died, um, and whose mother had been praying for some sort of sign that he was okay. And I was given in a dream, right? It was sort of a dream mm -hmm. state thing, no sort of crossing over, no uh, heart stoppage or right. anything like that. So that's obviously not a, by definition, a near death experience. Right. But how, how do we define these sorts of experiences? What, what is an NDE? Yeah. And you know, I mean, there are all kinds of experiences and, and, and people share them with me. Um, I have, because I am a cynic and a skeptic at heart yeah. too, I focused in on the ones that it's clinical death. Okay. So, um, when people clinically die, you know, your heart stops beating and within, within a minute you have no brain waves, right? Your brain waves cease. And yet these people are resuscitated either by modern medicine, some cases miracle, um, some a few minutes, but some hours mm -hmm. and hours. And yet they come back and when they come back, they report being more alive than they ever were, mm. uh, in, in a body still that was like, they were themselves completely. In fact, some people say even more myself, wow. um, in a place more real, uh, you know, yeah. than, than this, which I, I had a guy come up to me today after the service, uh, several who had had near death experiences and said that exact thing. How many? Four, four people from one Sunday morning yeah. came and told you this. Yeah. Wow. Well, and that's the other thing people don't realize, you know, Gallup did a poll in the late eighties of Americans and found out one out of 25 Americans has had a near, near death experience. That's, wow. that's like 13 million statistically, yeah. but even more recently, 2019, the, um, European Academy of Neurology reported a study across 35 countries that showed that 5%, one out of 20 people in 35 countries have had a near-death experience. 
So th- that's why I think it's so important to make sense of them because yeah. this is not just a, like a weirdo blip out there. This is millions of people, right? but they don't often talk about it. They don't. I, why? I, well, because in, like you said, until re- really five years ago, it wasn't out there on the internet for everybody to see. Right. It wasn't that known. I mean, people have been studying it for the last 40 years, but it hasn't been accepted in the Christian community yeah. in the early days. A lot of pastors and other Christians, it, it spooked them. They mm-hmm. didn't know what to think. And so yeah. they kind of like, well, just stay away from that. Right. Um, and it's kind of on par with like alien abduction kinds of things, tinfoil hat sort of things. And, and kind of the woo woo kind of, um, yeah. it was easily dismissed. Yeah. Yeah. And they say it is a sacred experience and it, And the way I like to explain it and the reason it's so hard for them to talk about is what is, how do you explain something more real than this? Right. But that's what they consistently say. And the way I explain it to people who haven't had a near death experience after interviewing so many is by analogy. So imagine, you know, right now we're living a three dimensional experience. Sure. But imagine if we were living this experience actually on a flat two dimensional black and white painting in your room. Yeah. And death means separation. So at death, your two dimensional self is peeled off that flat painting and brought out into this three dimensional room of color that was around you all the time. Mm. You just couldn't perceive of it because you didn't have a third dimension Yeah, to even perceive in. And now you're experiencing three dimensions of color. It's, you're more alive than you were in your flat world and you can see your flat world for what it is. Cause it's a part of this bigger realm. Right. Then you're pressed back into the flat world and now you have to explain three dimensions of color, but in two dimensional black and white terms. <laughs> what would you say? Well, and that's what they say when I use that analogy with them, they say, Oh, absolutely. That's it. Yeah. Because what they're experiencing is multidimensional to, to our dimensionality. Does it depress them to go back into the painting? Usually. Really? Usually I've, I've met a few who, who wanted to go back, but most beg to stay. Wow. And, uh, the Lord either tells them, no, you still have a purpose to fulfill. You have to go back yeah. and sends them back. In some cases he gives them a choice. Right. What, what's the scientific explanation? Like how does, uh, how does science maybe answer some of the questions in its way, like uh, in ways that might even contradict our interpretation as Christians, like what you're writing about in the book, like how does science explain it away? Alternate explanations. Yeah. 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 And, um, in chapter two of imagine the God of heaven, this new book, I go through the 10 points of evidence that convince me, but not just me, many skeptical medical doctors believe that this shows proof of consciousness surviving death. Really? And yeah, I'll, I'll go just a few of them, but, um, one is verifiable observations. Mm-hmm. This, this is the one that got my attention. So at first I was like, yeah, who knows what that is? But then what people say is when they first die, they leave their body. They still have a spiritual body. And initially they're often up above their body, observing up above their physical body, right. observing the resuscitation yeah. or what's happening in the room. Now there've actually been studies done because there, you know, uh, an example of this, uh, would be, um, like in, in the new book, there's a, a woman in London who dies giving childbirth mm. and she's up above her body. And then she goes through a tunnel in this beautiful place. She's with God. She, she doesn't want to come back, but he says, no, you need to go back. Your son, Michael is going to live. Mm. And you know, she, she didn't know if he was dying too. She comes back and as she's coming back, she comes through the ceiling toward her body and she sees on the top side of a ceiling fan, right. a red sticker. Yeah. And she comes back into her body. They shock her twice. She sees them shocking her twice. She comes to, and she starts trying to tell the doctors and nurses of this incredible experience and nobody believes her and they right. they think it's just psychosis or whatever. And finally she gets a a nurse to listen because she told the nurse things she said. Right. When she, when, you know, this woman was comatose, she shouldn't have heard any of that or seen. And she said, look, I'll prove it to you. 
get a ladder and go look on the top side of that ceiling fan and you'll find a sticker, a red sticker. And this is what it says on the sticker. And the nurse and an orderly yeah. see it and they're like, it was there. My favorite one was the guy in surgery and the doctors were telling unseemly jokes oh, yeah. about him or something. And he, he came back and told them the jokes that they were saying. They yeah. were caught red handed. Yeah. And that was Dr. Rajiv Parti. Yeah. So that's a fascinating one because he was an chief anesthesiologist at the Bakersfield Heart Hospital. Mm. And he, did, he had seen many people come back from anesthesia talking about a near-death experience and just would give them a shot of Haladol uh, of, right. of an antipsychotic drug. He sure. just thought it was nonsense. And then he had one. Mm -hmm. And none of the doctors believed him. And his is, his is fascinating because truly his was like a Damascus Road encounter like the apostle Paul had, you know, yeah. the apostle Paul didn't believe in Jesus. Sure. Um, he was persecuting Christians, having him arrested when he's on the way to Damascus and the same brilliant God of light that appears to NDEs around the world appears to Saul. Yeah. And, and, and Saul knows this is God. And he says, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. Right. And, and, you know, Jesus doesn't tell him what to do or doesn't explain the, the message of the good news or anything like that. Sure. Later, Ananias comes to Paul and explains it. And then Paul has to decide. Yeah. What's fascinating is that happened to Dr. Partee. Almost exactly. So he goes from initially having a hellish experience uh -huh. and crying out, he said, in repentance to God. And then being taken by these two, he said, Christian angels. They were angels that are from the Bible. Uh -huh. And he's taken to this beautiful place in front of this God of light who's brighter than the sun by a thousand times, he said, and full of love for him. And he said, I, I'm, I want you to see your life again. Hmm. And then he, Dr. Partee has a life review where he sees that he had become abusive toward his son and he'd gotten addicted to painkillers and alcoholism, yeah. all kinds of other things. and. And, and he thought, God's going to send me back to hell. Yeah. But instead he said, I'm, I'm going to send you back and you need to make changes. Mm -hmm. And he goes back and he said, interestingly, I had the thought that that was Jesus. He said, if not, it's this God who understands all of our weaknesses and that we're not perfect, but is willing to forgive us. Hmm. Okay. Then he, he's later helping his friend Naresh, who is dying, understand this God who he encountered and all that. Yeah. The night Naresh dies, Rajiv wakes up to a vision of heaven's parting. He sees the same God of light and Naresh standing by him. This wow. is the very night Naresh died. Yeah. And he starts to leave his body again. And God says to him, it's not your time. You need to go back. Yeah. And he says, Lord, who are you? Because he had, he had actually gone and gotten baptized, but uh -huh. then was questioning and struggling with it. And he says, who are you? And he said, out of the light steps a man with a beard and a robe with a gold sash and says, I'm Jesus, your savior. I mean, he, he grew up Hindu. Wow. And, and it doesn't make any sense. And yet all over the globe, people are encountering the same God of light, of love, but this is the same God who revealed himself to Moses yeah. 3,500 years ago as this brilliant light that wouldn't burn up the bush. Mm. Right. Yeah. And then to Daniel and then Jesus is transfigured on the mountain. Remember, right. He became brighter than the sun. Sure. And so and he said, I am the light. I of am the, the light of the world. Yeah. And there's imagery in the prophets of like, I don't remember where it is exactly. You probably, I think you're the one that brought this to my attention, but this idea of the light emanating from the sun, like he is the light in heaven. And that's sort of the biblical vision of what, um, of what reality will look like when we finally get there. Yeah. I just think it's important for our listeners and viewers to understand that these aren't just nice stories that affirm our deepest desires for what we hope you know, is awaiting us on the other side. And it's not wishful thinking kind of stuff happening here. There are empirical data points that a reasonable person can consider and reach the conclusions that, that you've reached. I mean, 
You, you didn't yeah. get there just because you felt like you wanted this to be true. Yeah. And these verifiable observations that they make have been studied. Yeah. So for instance, Dr. Janice Holden did a study of, of around a hundred patients who had cardiac arrest and claimed to have a near death experience. And they each made observations about what was happening in the room of their resuscitation. Each one may make, you know, five, 10 observations. Well, what she found is 92% of their observations were completely accurate. Accurate, okay. meaning it was exactly matched. what actually happened when they verified oh, with the doctors mean. and the nurses. Mm -hmm. Another 6% um, were mostly accurate. Only 2% were inaccurate. Wow. Turns out that was one of the, of the patients. Yeah. And so you've got verifiable observations that ties it to this real world. It's, yeah. it's, it's not just a hallucination. Right. And it can't be a blip in the brain either. Because, um, and I put a case in Imagine the God of Heaven of Pam Reynolds, which I think is the most, it's, it's one of the most, the strongest cases yeah. because she had clickers going in her ears. She had all the blood drained out of her brain, no brain waves, her eyes taped shut. There was no way to get any stimulus from the outside and they made sure there was nothing happening in the brain. Right. So it's not the brain. Yeah. And you know, some like, um, skeptics like doc, Dr. Michael Shermer, who originally would say it's just something the brain does when right. it's dying. Well, then you realize, well, that doesn't account for most of this data. Mm -hmm. And so he says, well, it's just what happens in the brain as it's booting back up. It, it, it kind of puts these pieces together. Hmm. Well, the problem is like Pam Reynolds, she's coming back in the middle of surgery. She describes the saw they used to saw open her skull. Cause Lord. she was in this deep, uh, it was a deep aneurysm. They yeah. were having to get out, operate out of her deep lobe in her brain. And, um, so she describes that she describes what the nurses and doctors said in the midst of the deepest anesthesia Yeah, and that they were playing hotel California <laughs> as they operated on her and that they shocked her heart twice, not once. Huh. And yet all these things she accurately reports. Well, if your brain just does a, a blip when it comes back, yeah. And it's not getting any, any sensory information. Right. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. There's a lot that doesn't make sense about a uh, rational explanation or uh, materialistic, let's say explanation of these phenomena. I mean, not least of which is the fact that blind people see things accurately. <laughs> well, and, and, and that's another point of evidence that I write about because, you know, I have, uh, I, I think three or four blind people in imagine the God of heaven. And, um, for, for instance, some of the things, so not only do they see in their near death experience, but they see the same things sighted people do. Yeah. But some of the things they report seeing, they would not have heard that that's how things work. So let uh, me give you an example. Okay. So near death experiencers commonly say that in, in this heavenly realm, light isn't like light, like we experience light. It's light that is palpable light. That is life and love. Right. And blind people say, like um, Vicky and, and this other one, Debbie, said the light was coming out of things, mm. out of the trees, out of the flowers, out of the birds, even, even out of the people, this welcoming committee of people coming toward her. Now, here's the crazy thing. That's common of near-death experiencers around the globe saying that. Light, yeah. light in heaven comes out of everything. And it's more vivid than anything you've ever seen. Yeah. But Isaiah 60 says there, there is no sun or moon in heaven because God is its light. That's it. Yeah. Revelation 21, John says there's no sun or moon because the glory of God is its light and Jesus, the lamb is its lamp and the nations will walk in that light. Right. So here you have uh, as well, Jesus in John 13 said, then the righteous will shine like the stars in their father's kingdom forever. Hmm. So even this light coming out of people, it's the glory of God that we share in. It's the life and love of God flowing through everything, giving yeah. life to everything. Now, how would a blind person say no to say that? Because they would not have heard that light shines out of everything. Uh -huh. They would have heard light shines on things. Sure. That's so, interesting. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many points of evidence like that. People on the other side, one blind person and imagine the God of heaven, Debbie, 
then in her near death experience, she sees her mom come in to rescue her. She's able to later say what her mom looked like and was wearing. Wow. She was wearing a robe and it was a dark color. She didn't know what color she said. Yeah, it was my black robe. <laughs> then she travels, you know, again to this heavenly place is with God who tells her she's got to go back. She's going to have children. She was told she couldn't have children. Mm. She did have children wow. when she came back, but she met her grandmother who she had never met because her grandmother died when she was a, a young child. Right. And she comes back and she describes to her mom what her grandmother looked like. And her mom said, yeah, that's right. But when she was 30, wow, well, that's another commonality that people in heaven are typically in their prime in about, their prime. about their thirties. You know, <laughs> that's good news. Yeah. <laughs> for uh, all of us. 29 was a good year for me. Yeah. I like that. Way better than 45. Yeah. Uh, try 60. Uh, yeah. I don't know, man. Okay, guys, this seems like the perfect time to take a quick break and tell you about an organization that is near and dear to my heart. Um, Jubilee Prison Ministries is changing lives every day throughout the state of Texas. I've seen it myself firsthand, how Jubilee is changing inmates' lives, first and foremost by hosting Jubilee Weekends, where inmates enjoy great food, they make new friends with folks on the outside, and most importantly, they hear the hopeful message of Jesus that in many cases changes their lives forever. But inmates aren't the only people who have their whole trajectory shifted and altered by Jesus through Jubilee. I've seen personally uh, God moving powerfully in the lives of men and women who serve through Jubilee um, and their weekends inside of Texas prisons. I personally know guys, for example, who were pretty good guys, pretty good men, before they chose to step up and serve through Jubilee, but after their first weekend volunteering, in a prison, uh, I've witnessed those same guys be transformed by God into great men, uh, men with uh, fire in their eyes and uh, passion to change the world. And the best part is that um, these guys don't just catch fire for a time and then, you know, that fire goes out and they go back to being who they were before. These guys are forever transformed because Jubilee's approach is so relational that the guys find the, the folks who are serving alongside of them are their friends on mission together um, for a lifetime. It's truly amazing to see. But Jubilee isn't just for men, by the way, they're also looking for women to step up and serve in women's prison units throughout the state or to provide outside support for all the Jubilee weekends and men's and women's units alike. If you're ready to, to serve and you're willing to make a difference in the lives of incarcerated men and women throughout the state of Texas, and maybe you need to make a change in your own life as well, you're ready for something more. I hope you'll visit jubileeprisonministries.org for more information about how to volunteer. If you're not ready to serve in person in a prison yet, please consider um, making a donation through their website. Again, that's jubileeprisonministry.org. Um, you will make a difference just by making a donation. Jubilee is an ecumenical nonprofit organization, and all donations are tax deductible. Thanks for listening, and now let's get back to today's episode. We haven't even really gotten into what I think might be the single biggest sort of card to play in this argument, which is people from different religions and cultures and places experiencing the same God. And it's particularly, obviously, the God the Bible describes, the yeah. the, the, the Lord, you know, Jesus Christ. And I, I, I don't know what to do with that, John, other than just say, okay, fine, I get it, God, like this is true, all this is real, but you've got Hindus and you know Muslim imams in your book that talk about experiencing a near-death experience, experiencing the God of the Bible, and then everything changes. And the other interesting thing about those people is that there's no incentive whatsoever. Oh, no. It's not, it's not a case where they're going to write a bestseller and make a ton of money off of this. You know, no. they're going to they're gonna be killed, potentially. Yeah. In they suffer instance. a lot of persecution. Yeah. So talk about those experiences that people have across cultural and religious lines. Yeah. And, and you know, that's, that's part of what I think why I think God asked me to leave what I had done before and do this because I think he wants all people of all nations to understand he loves every person uniquely. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we sometimes, I sometimes do this when I'm going through an airport, there's so many people I'm like, I'm just one of so many people. And you just feel like yeah. it doesn't matter. Right. But you know what? It's not true. 
to God, you are unique. There is no one else he created like you. Hmm. And as one in the ear that you heard Dean said, you know, he realized that God, God has a special love for you that is unique. There's, it's not for anyone else. Yeah. And, and, and so I think. <laughs> I loved it too when he said, somebody asked me if God gave me a hug. And his, he said, I said, everything about him was hugging me. I I just, uh, that just ro- rocked me. Yeah. You know, and I thought about, obviously I thought about my mom who I lost last year and just yeah. being everything about God hugging her. It's just, I mean, it just brings me such joy and comfort, but yeah. it's more than a feeling. It's a, it's a, it's an assurance. Well, and, and, you know, like you pointed out, it is another point of evidence. Like, how do you explain 48% of people having near death experiences encounter this light that is love, this God of light and love, or, or they just encounter Jesus himself. They know yeah. he's Jesus mm-hmm. and yet they have nothing to gain. It doesn't match many times their, yeah. their cultural upbringing. Now I, I want to say something because I think sometimes this really bothers people because they're like, um, because they hear it almost like, Oh, well you're saying you're right and we're Mm -hmm. wrong. Yeah. And it's not that at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you know, part of why I wrote this is I think, I think Christian, a lot of Christians get it wrong Mm -hmm. because they don't understand that God uniquely loves every person Mm -hmm. and he is with every person and wanting to, he's as close as their heart turning to him. Yeah. You know, Joel said, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, yeah. will be set right with God. And that really is what he was doing through Jesus. He was making a way that in our broken, evil world where we all sin, we all turn away from God. Yeah. And if you don't believe you do, just, just think about this. How many days do you wake up thinking, God, how can I do your will today versus what do I want to do today or what do I have to do today? Right. Yeah. And we all do. And and yet he, he holds out forgiveness for every person. Yeah. The only thing that can keep us away from God is our pride. Right. Just saying, I don't, I don't want you and I don't need your forgiveness. I got it. Yeah. I do, I do appreciate that word because I think it's easy for Christians to hear this and kind of spike the football a little bit or something like, uh, you know, we were right all along kind of, you know, um, uh, high and mighty about it. And that's obviously not why you wrote these books and it's not an appropriate response to, to these uh, uh, phenomena at all. However, I am curious to know whether there's been any research done that reveals any of the reverse happening where Christians die and meet, you know, Vishnu, the, the Hindu yeah. goddess or, or, or meet, um, you know, Muhammad, the prophet, or any, is there any other, are there any examples, at least in terms of the numbers and magnitude of people that are coming to Jesus, regardless of whether they're Christians? Yeah. So here, so here's the interesting thing is if you just go read near death experiences, you will hear people saying, you know, oh, I encountered, um, this God or this goddess. But I, I, I point out that there's a difference between what people report and how they interpret what they report. Hmm. And that's a very important distinction. And it, that's part of why it took me so long to write Imagine Heaven, because mm-hmm. that was confusing to me as well. Yeah. Um, I'll give an example. I, I, have, um, I have multiple people who grew up Hindu in the book who, right. who encounter Jesus. Santosh yep. is another one who he's taken by this God of light, and he describes the holy city of God just like in Revelation 21. Yet he had zero background in the Bible. Yeah. And, and then, you know, I told you he comes back and he starts reading the Bible. He's like, everything I experienced was in there. Yeah. And be, he becomes a follower of Jesus. Another guy, Jang Jaswal, um, uh, Dr. Parti. Um, uh-huh. there, so there are multiple ones, but they don't all initially, um, interpret it that way. They interpret it in their own cultural framework. Sure. So for instance, there's, um, another guy I report of in the book, Arvind, who he says, you know, in the hospital, he leaves his body, he floats out into the hallway of the hospital. And there this like hallway opens up and this brilliant God of light and love is there. And then he goes back into his body. Yeah. That's another thing. Some NDEs are shallow. They're, they're, they're not that long of an experience. So that leaves a lot of room to interpret. Right. Yeah. So Arvin comes back and what he says is I, I experienced the, the goddess Kalika. 
Now, the problem with that is Kalika or Kali is described as this, this goddess who is either black or blue with a long tongue and, um, and four arms with, mm -hmm. with weapons in it. And that's not at all who he reported seeing. Right. Who he did report seeing was the same God of light and love that appeared to Moses and appeared to Daniel and that, yeah. you know, but Jesus his only appeared category to was, but, but that's, that's who he worshiped. Sure. And so he, that's who he, he knew this was divine. Interesting. Uh, an even better example, Nia, um, was also, um, uh, Hindu by background, but she was in Africa when, uh, she ended up going into a, a lion's cage with, a, with the trainer, but the lioness actually mauled her, bit, bit her head. Oh. She leaves her body, and she says there was this, this glow like, like the sun, like, like the morning, dawn, and that, that took me to this place of incredible beauty. And she said, God definitely exists. Mm. And she comes back, okay? And then she says, I encountered uh, Durga Ma, the, the goddess Durga. Uh -huh. Now, again, Durga is described as a beautiful woman where, riding a lion uh, or a tiger with, with like 12 arms, you know, and weapons yeah. in the arm. That's not who she saw. Right. She saw the same God of light and love. Yeah. And then she said, interestingly, I came back with a knowledge of Christianity and Jesus, which I didn't have before. Huh. Why Jesus? Yeah. But this is consistent. Yeah. And so to answer your question, no, I really haven't. I haven't heard people actually report experiencing what they would expect of another God or goddess. Like actual characteristics and qualities that right. match what those religions teach about those gods and goddesses. Right. But they do experience this God of light who is love and personal, not an impersonal force. Yeah. Very personal, knows them personally. Things they forgot about their life, God shows them in their life review. Mm. And what, what they come back consistently saying is God is love. They know that without a doubt. And how we love and treat one another is what God cares about most. Wow. Well, that's what Moses said. Cover to cover. Jesus baby. said, <laughs> love God, love your neighbor. That sums up the whole Bible. Right. Yeah. You can't love God and hate your neighbor, right? That's pretty much a, uh, yeah. a sticking point in the Bible, um, from start to finish. So let's talk a little bit more about the qualities of this God that people experience. Um, we've talked more generally about light and love and things. What, what other characteristics stood out to you when you started listening closely to what people experienced? Yeah. I mean, in the book, I'm, 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 I'm trying to sneak people into really understanding the theology of God, yeah. uh, you know, by showing these are the things that God has revealed over thousands of years about himself. Um, so it's not new information. It's based not on, new, uh -huh. but, but when you hear how people experienced these qualities, you know, like one, um, you know, like w words like omniscient uh -huh. means all knowing. Well, in the life review, people experience God's omniscience. Um, at, at other points, they say they look into his eyes and, and suddenly every question they ever had was answered. Wow. Now, you know, Paul said right now we, we see as in a mirror dimly, but, but then we will see clearly now, you know, we, we know in part, but then we will know in full just as we are fully known. Right. So they start to experience some of the some of the qualities of, of God like that, um, his eminence, meaning he is in everything. He's sure. everywhere in everything and, and he's infinite. So, so even though God appeared as Jesus to reveal uh, himself to us, that's not all there is to God. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, this, this was an aha I had is that even though God appears as God, the father on his throne, in the center of this holy city, that's not all there is to God. Hmm. I actually think God, the father on the throne is the manifestation of God for the inhabitants of heaven. But God is spirit. He's everywhere. Yeah. Always. But he's not only in his creation. He's beyond his creation. He sure. transcends his creation. And so 
when you hear these NDEs talk about the experience of that, it, it brings meaning to it. Yeah. Like I can trust this God because he does have it all under control. He's big enough to have it all under control. He does hear all our prayers. He, mm. he does uniquely love each one of us because he's greater than the box I keep him in. Yeah. It also kind of must help them make sense of complex theological things like the Trinity, yeah, which is something a lot of believers, including most preachers and all of us struggle with. Like, how do we make sense of three and one? Uh, they see God in, in a different way when they have these experiences, right? How do they talk about the three and oneness of God? Yeah. And, um, you know, you heard some stories today that are out of the book um, uh-huh. that I showed the videos of, of, you know, like a 16 year old Jewish girl <laughs> who grew up hearing that, that there is no God. Her, her dad was an atheist and pretty abusive, honestly. Yeah. And, grew up hearing this mantra every day. There is no God. Your life is worthless. Jesus is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. Yet she, despite that, believed in God. And every night she prayed to God and felt like God was sitting there by her bed, comforting her. Wow. And then at 16, her horse falls on her. She dies. And there, 30 feet up in the air with her is Jesus. And he, he's bright like the sun, but it's Jesus. And she knows it's Jesus. And she said, but I knew him. It wasn't like, who are you? It was like, oh, huh. I know you. And he smiles at her. And she said it was like a reunion because they were old she friends. knew this was the God she had always prayed to. And then in her life review, he shows her herself as a little girl praying at night <laughs> And he shows her himself sitting by her bedside, comforting her. So now, this is a, th- wh- how and why would she think that? Then Jesus takes her into this. She, he takes her to, I guess it's heaven. Um, I, I'll tell you honestly, I don't know if this is heaven uh, or if it's something Pre-heaven. in between. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in some cases, I do think he's letting them see heaven, like the Holy City yeah. and stuff like that. But in some cases something else, something yeah. in between, but got to retitle the books. Yeah. Well, I know <laughs> it, yeah, it gets complicated, <laughs> but he, he takes her, Jesus takes her into this light that she says was infinite yeah. love. And suddenly she finds herself with the father and she's there and just being embraced by God, the father, like a little girl. And she was a little girl. She was 16 yeah. and had been abused. Sure. And so you think about the tenderness of God, mm. like he knew he, he knew how Jesus knew how, how fun it would be because they, they went like the speed of light. Sure. She said like Superman and Lois Lane going yeah. there. And she was a horse rider. So she likes, she loves probably. speed. Yeah. She said it was the funnest thing I've ever done in my life, <laughs> but then the tenderness of God and she never wanted to leave. Now, Jesus said, you have to go back yeah. and I want you to tell everything you've heard. And, and that's an important thing. Indies are not a crossover into either eternal life or eternal death. They're mm-hmm. not. Right. There's something in between. God knows they're going to come back. That's why you struggle with whether it's heaven and its fullness or not. Exactly. Yeah. And, and um, when she comes back, Jesus left, but he left her with his presence. And she didn't really understand that till later. You know, she's, she still considers herself Jewish, but she follows Jesus as the Messiah. Yeah. And she realized, well, that was the Holy Spirit. Now, she had no context for that. Right. And yet that's what she described. And again and again, I give evidence of near-death experiencers who experience the Trinity, but they say things like like Dean Braxton that you heard today said, you know, in heaven, you know, we, we say Father, Son, and Spirit, and we think of them as three, but nobody thinks like that there. They're just one. Yeah. And you can't separate one from the other, even though they are we would say separate, but I, I, I think the problem is everything we express is in our three dimensional sure. separate terms. Mm-hmm. So we don't have, but it uh, helps you. Oh I mean, yeah. I mean, I think you, you've read it. it. It helps you go, Oh, okay. It does make sense, but just beyond our limitations. Sure. Yeah. I can imagine I mean, any, anyone, any honest skeptic could imagine that in uh, the next whatever, 
there are dimensions that we will understand and be able to sort of attain. Well, look, our mathematicians have proven that's it. right. You know, I mean, Kaluza Klein, two scientists who, you know, they were trying to rec rectify the unified field theory. Yeah. You know, uh, Einstein's equations of general relativity work perfectly for large masses like planets. Um, quantum mechanics works perfectly for the microscopic, but they don't work together. Yeah. And what they found is if there is a fifth dimension added to the equations, they work perfectly. Really? And, and so then that led to string theory where our scientists postulate there may be even 11 unseen dimensions. Uh -huh. We, you know, we know of three, right? Well, four time is the fourth. Sure. And so, yeah. And even on the other side, time works differently. You know, I was well, going to ask about that. Yeah, actually. well, Peter, I, I know I find it fascinating, right? Because uh, Peter in Second Peter three eight, you know, one of Jesus' disciples said, "Don't forget this: to the Lord, a, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day." Yeah. Well, near death experiencers say almost the exact same thing. They'll, they'll say things like, "Time stopped," or "There was no time," mm. or "Well, there was there was time, but there was all the time in the world," and. So the different ones describe it differently. But yeah. what I postulate in the book, and actually this guy, Greg Rickert, that I interviewed, experienced it. But I postulate that there, if there are two dimensions of time, you know, we, we move forward linearly in one direction on a timeline. Sure. But if there are two dimensions of time, that means at every point on that timeline, there's another line going horizontal that you can stay on as long as you want. Wow. Well, what that would mean is there would be time moving forward, but at each moment of time, you have all the time you need. <laughs> Boom. I need Christopher <laughs> Nolan to make a movie about it. <laughs> That's so good. Oh my gosh. I was, I was wondering if there's any correlation between how long someone's under and what time, you know, length of time they're experiencing. No, yeah. I can't find any. Yeah. Which, which would feed the theory that it just works different there. Yeah. 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 I don't know because some, you know, that are gone here for 10 minutes might feel like they had days or don't know how long it was. Yeah. Um, some that might be gone for hours, you know, I, it's, it's, it doesn't seem to correlate. Right. That's amazing. And I could, you know, just, uh, have a glass of wine with you and keep talking about that <laughs> alone and just trying to figure that out. Um, but an, another characteristic of God that came up again and again in the book that I really appreciated, because I've always felt this about God as long as I've been a believer, and I don't think enough people think about the joy yeah. and laughter of God. Yeah, you, you went to seminary, right? Unfortunately, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the fascinating things in, in researching and writing Imagine the God of Heaven is I dug back through all my old theological seminary textbooks, mm -hmm. right? Because... What I wanted to do is, is show these things that you read about in the Bible and bring them to life through these 70 people who have experienced him. Right. And what's interesting is, you know, you got all those words, omniscient, omnipotent, you know, imminent, transcendent, you know, right. omnipresent, all that. But do you know, I could not find one descriptor of God as joyful in any seminary textbook. Really? I'm not surprised. Joy was not a characteristic of God. <laughs> And I find that so ironic because, you know, in, in the old Testament, John, God commanded the Israelites to party. Yeah. We don't think about that, but seven festivals that the whole nation was to come together seven times a year. Right. And he says to them, I want you to celebrate with joy before the Lord mm -hmm. for seven days. What? Yeah. You know, and, and Jesus last night on earth, he, he said, I've told you these things so that my joy would be in you and that your joy would overflow. Right. And I think people just don't picture God as joyful. Mm -hmm. I think or, about or like, as enjoying. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoying us and enjoying us, enjoying him. And I think about the old song or Psalm that we used to sing in church in my small town church growing up. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You know, the joy of the Lord. I don't know if you know that song, but uh, <laughs> I used to interpret it like, well, the joy I have in the Lord right. is my strength. It's from a psalm. Yeah. But your book sort of made me wonder, like, is it the Lord's joy that's it is. my strength? Like, that's how it seems to be worded. Like, it's his joy that is our strength. What does that mean? And what do the NDE's uh, experiences say about the joy? Yeah, I mean, 
you know, we, we sometimes we read the Bible and it, it, we can miss it because honestly, a lot of the Old Testament happened with the Old Testament prophets in a season of rebellion of Israel, warning them over and over and over again. Yeah. So you feel like, well, God's just mad all the time. No, he was that patient, hoping yeah. they wouldn't just keep hardening their hearts. But that's, that's a temporary that's, that's a temporary response of God right. to a world that turns away from him. His permanent response is joy. That's, that's where he lives. C.S. Lewis said, joy is the serious business of heaven. <laughs> and that's what indie ears say as well. So like this one guy, Randy, is a CEO. He has uh, embolisms in his, in his leg that travel up and block his pulmonary artery mm. and his body shuts down. And he, he rises up. Interestingly, he sees the realm all around us, the, the spiritual dimension all around us, he cries out to Jesus. Um, he was a believer in Jesus, but he was really struggling with God. And the next thing he knows, he's, he's up, he's traveling up and he's embraced and he knows who this is. And he feels an arm around his stomach and he feels a beard on his face. <laughs> That's personal. And he knows this is Jesus <laughs> and he drops to his knees and he's just overwhelmed. And, and Jesus turns him around and picks him up and he looks into his eyes and he said, you know, I, I knew love. I knew the love of a child. I knew the love of a spouse, but I'd never looked into the eyes of love itself. Gosh. And he said, I just never wanted to leave. Mm. And he and Jesus begin to walk through this beautiful paradise you know, like you heard Jim say, flowers and, and trees and forests and mountains in the distance. Beauty like earth, but so vivid. Yeah. Colors that we've never even seen before and, and just life flowing out of everything. And what was interesting, Randy grew up in a very hard childhood. He, uh, he had um, really bad asthma. So he's in and out of the hospital a lot. Mm. As, as a result, he was a bit overweight. He got bullied a lot. Um, he only had one friend and this one friend ended up getting attacked by a gang. So they moved oh away. Gosh. He lost his friend, his little dog, Casey was all he had. And Jesus starts showing him these, he called them life vignettes, but it's like a life review. And he shows him this, he's showing them all this painful memories of a childhood. Yeah. And, and, and Randy was like, Lord, why are you showing me this? Kind of like, I don't want to see that. And then it hit him. Were you there with me? Like even through that? And he, and he turns and he looks at Jesus and there, there's a tear wow. going down Jesus' face. And he says, I was always with you. I've always been with you, just waiting for you to turn to me. <sighs> and then he, he, he's going on and he comes to this river and there are rivers in heaven. And, you know, you know, Jesus talks about the, the river of life, yeah. right? Which he said was of the Holy spirit, uh -huh. those rivers of living water. Right. And, and well, Randy wants to drink. He has this desire to drink of the water. So he does, he, he scoops it up and, and he said, as soon as I did, it was like ecstasy, like joy just burst through me. And he's just like, it was unbelievable. And, and he, and he turns to Jesus and, um, and Jesus shows him across this meadow. There are these children playing and, and he, and he says, what is this Lord? And, and he said, these are the children whose lives were taken too early. I'm restoring their joy. Oh my gosh. And then he looks back at Jesus and Jesus is holding a flask like a bottle. Uh huh. And, and again, he's like, everything was intentional and the Lord is mysterious. He is uh -huh. the, the parable telling God, by uh -huh. the way, yeah. <laughs> so this fits Jesus parable <laughs> telling and, and he's got this flask and he said, what is that Lord? And he said, I've been collecting your tears, beloved. And he takes the bottle and he pours it into the river and instantly Randy knew he, he's returning my sorrows for joy. Yeah. It, it was like, it was like all of the sorrows we've been through in life, we weren't alone and God saw him and he counts every one. And when we stay faithful to him through that, mm. he's going to return it for joy. Yeah. And, and sorrow's not the permanent sorrow's the temporary. 
Suffering's not the permanent. Suffering's the temporary. Right. The separation from God, but the permanent is his joy. Wow. That is, I mean, I don't know why we have such trouble believing that, but, but I know I'm hard of heart in that way, man. And what you're describing is, is on par with so many of the, what I would have called like cheesy images of Jesus. Like I remember laughing at the image of Jesus laughing. You ever seen that, that painting of Jesus like, uh, or whatever is laughing? Yeah. I just remember being dismissive of that and, and dismissive Me too. of like Jesus, uh, you know, on his knees next to the kid in prayer, like, and that, that whole picture and the whole, all the children's Bible memes and so the cutesy stuff. And man, maybe that was all closer to the true heart of God than, than my serious, you know, the, uh, theological view. Well, like, you know, like I said this morning and what I'm trying to do in imagine the God of heaven is help us all realize we all put God in a box, Yeah, you know, and the truth is God is powerful. Like you hear Dr. Ron Smotherman, <laughs> you know, and this neurologist saying it was like standing five feet away from the source of a nuclear explosion. <laughs> his yeah. power was undeniable. Right. Right. And, and his, his sovereignty and omniscience. When you hear another doctor, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Mark McCullough, who, as a 16 year old was, he died in a fire mm -hmm. when he, where he lost his mom and, and younger brother. And yet when he died during that, he came back and he was in the presence of God with his mother and brother. And he said, it was like we were cozied up on the couch together. Everything was right. And he said, in God's presence, I, I saw it all. And he said, all I could say is, yes, your plan is perfect. It yeah. makes perfect sense. Right. But then he has to go back and he suffered in this life. Uh -huh. And, you know, what I'm trying to show is that God is bigger and greater and more powerful and omniscient and sovereign and really does have a plan. All that big stuff, sure. more than we've imagined, but he's also more relatable and fun mm -hmm. and enjoys us. It actually yeah. has fun. Yeah, like your guy, uh, the doctor, I think, um, Dr. Ron, said you wouldn't expect God, the almighty God, to be ready to laugh his ASS off. But yeah. that's who he found, <laughs> which was great. Well, and Heidi, you know, Heidi said, as, and, and Greg Rickert, too, said, as Jesus is showing them their life review, many times they kind of like paused and just laughed at what happened to him and like not laughing at him, but just laughing about it. Right. <laughs> And, and, and I think this is so important, you know, honestly, it, oh, yeah. it's so important because we don't pursue God because either we think he's not great enough to really be trusted right? or we think he's not kind enough to be trusted yeah. or relatable enough sure. to be honest. But here's the thing, you know, he, he came into our world as Jesus to show us he gets it. Hmm. He's been through it all. He gets us fully. Yeah. And the truth is nobody gets you more and nobody wants to help you through life more. Another, yeah. another powerful thing that Randy, the CEO said is in heaven. He started to, to realize he too ex experienced the father, son, and spirit, but as one, he said, I started to realize that Jesus was with me by my side the whole time, but sometimes he was speaking to me in my thoughts, just like some of them call it telepathy, but it's more than just in your thoughts. It's complete feeling, uh -huh. thought, communication. And other times Jesus spoke to me verbally. Yeah. And he said, when he was speaking to me just in my thoughts, I realized this is the voice of the Holy Spirit. And he said, I realized that the Lord is speaking to us all the time, but we just haven't learned to listen and to hear his voice. You know, many times in the scriptures, Jesus said, let he who has ears to hear, hear what the spirit says. Yeah. Right. Well, we all have these round things on the sides of our heads, Yeah. but that, that means it's a, it's a spiritual kind of hearing. Right. And we've got to develop that. That's right. And be willing to actually hear. Well, and I think, I think that is insightful too. what Nindy ears tell us is because God's preferred way of communication is thought to thought. Hmm. That's another 
common thread throughout a lot of the NDEs. Oh yeah, that, that, that it, it's it's like they call it, like I said, telepathic in yeah. the sense that it's it's thought to thought, and I think that's very important. You know, I, I give an analogy sometimes that we want God to speak audibly, right? Yeah, sure. That's actually not the most direct form of communication, not for God. Huh. So right now, you know, I'm trying to get all the thoughts in my head into your head, right? <laughs> yes, uh -huh. Okay. Or whoever's listening. And, and yet I'm very limited. I, I, I have to use words. There are a lot of things I'm not saying cause I can't say them fast enough right. and you're not listening fast <laughs> enough cause you're thinking about lunch or something else. Right. And it's very, not very efficient. Uh, efficient. Yeah. <laughs> what I wish I could do is just put all my thoughts directly in your mind. Right. And then you would, you would have them there to understand if you wanted to, but you could also just, well, oh, that's a stupid thought. I don't want to think about that and think about lunch still. Right. Well, God can do that. And he does. Uh -huh. And, and he's actually guiding us or sometimes trying to guide us way more than we realize. And the way you learn to, and, and I write about this and imagine the God of heaven, the way you learn to walk with him in his joy is you learn to discern those thoughts and they're, they're always in line with what he's revealed about his will and his heart and scripture. Uh -huh. They're not going to contradict that. Hmm. But when you act in faith, that's when you see, hmm. I, I, I give some examples, you know, like one of them is, um, when I was still an engineer, my roommate, uh, was a communications coach and he was a Christian and full-time ministry and, and, uh, he, I would learn stuff. I'm, you know, driving an hour back and forth to work and I'm listening to these Christian tapes. I'd come back and I'd start to tell them what I'd learned and all these guys, man, you have a teaching gift. I'm like, Oh no, no, not me. I <laughs> uh, like, I don't do public speaking. I was terrified of public speaking. Really? Oh yeah. Terrified of it. And, um, like and Moses. He, yeah. And he said, no, 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 <laughs> let me, let me coach you. Let me just give a talk at the university and I'll coach you. It'll be great. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it, Dave. And he kept asking for months and Dave, just stop. I'm not going to do it. One day I'm praying about something completely different. And into my mind comes the thought, when you resist Dave, you resist me. Whoa. I knew I hadn't thought that thought. I didn't want to think that thought. <laughs> Where'd that even come from? And it came again. Yeah. When you resist Dave, you resist me. Wow. And I was like, a and, lot, and, a lot nicer to Dave after that. I and I, I said, yeah. So I said, yes. <laughs> wow. And you know, I, I was afraid that it would be terrible. It was worse than that. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to develop this gift, but he did. And you know, wow. when I think about like now having traveled to 30 countries, speaking to so many people, you know, it's like, how did you do that? Lord? Yeah. But it, it wasn't until I was willing to act that then I'm able to look back and see. Right. Yeah. And, and that's how we learn to discern the voice of God. Sure. Well, even as a skeptic about a lot of things, it's hard for me to find points of argument um, with what you've written and with the fruit of your work and um, the way it, it has grown and made manifest in people's lives and the transformation for Jesus that we see in people's lives. But I know you face a lot of criticism and pushback from within the church. And I've heard some of that, frankly, just ha by having had you on the podcast and by yeah. having, uh, having had you speak at the church. Just a very... Um, small minority of Christians, but still they yeah. usually are pretty vocal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, they'll, I, I've heard some of it, but what are some of the things you hear pushback wise from, from Christians inside the, the church? Well, I mean, it, it took me 35 years to write imagine heaven for a reason. Yeah. And when I did, I, I, I knew it was what the Lord wanted. Um, because I couldn't figure out why I was so enamored with this stuff, you know? Sure. And, um, but when I went to, to press send of the manuscript, I said to him, I said, well, Lord, this might be the end of my ministry, <laughs> but you said too. So here goes. Right. And, um, fascinatingly, I heard in my mind when I said that I've opened a door in heaven that no one can close. Really? Yeah. And I, man, I'll tell you, like, um, it doesn't make any sense. Like a, a book normally like it, it takes off and then it peters out and then it just, you know, right. Imagine heaven keeps growing every year. <laughs> I can't, I mean, there's no reason for it. Wow. It doesn't make any sense at all, yeah. except I think it's not about me at all. Yeah. And it's not even about these people who have these testimonies. 
what we're all testifying about is the goodness of God Uh and what he has prepared for those who love him. And there's nothing better. Sure. So what are the, when someone does push back, what are some of the things you hear? Like when, when they, what are their, Oh, there are lots of misunderstandings. It's hard to cover everything in every talk or, you know, so, um, you know, Christians oftentimes say, well, what are you saying? You saying everybody goes to heaven? No, I have a whole chapter in Imagine he- Heaven on Hell. <laughs> There's, yeah. you know, what it, percentage? At of- least twenty three percent. That's just one study, and that was of people who came forward. Twenty three percent. Let's finish that sentence for listeners. Twenty three percent of people who came forward talking about a near death experience had a hellish near death experience. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so hell is just as real as heaven, yeah. and they're testifying to that as well. But you know, um, Hmm. So, so that's not it. And then they'll say, well, why in the world would someone who doesn't even believe in God, um, you know, doesn't know Jesus, why would they, why would they see God or why would they see Jesus? Yeah. And I remind them that, well, Saul, you know, the the apostle Paul was Saul. He was a Pharisee who did not believe in Jesus and he was persecuting Christians killing them. Yeah. When he's on the Damascus road going to arrest Christians and this brilliant God of light, just like the one that appears to near death experiencers appears to Saul. And he says, who are you Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. Uh And I like to point out that Jesus does not explain the gospel. He doesn't tell them what to do. He sent later since Ananias to explain that. And that's because what God really wants is us to seek him Mm -hmm. because he wants our love. He wants our hearts. Sure. I think the part that is a threat to some people in the Christian world is probably the fact that the encounter happens after death or it seems to have happened after death. And I think, um, Christians do not want to give some Christians don't want to give anyone the impression that there's any chance beyond this life to accept um, the Lord and to become, you know, to, to be saved and that these stories might give people the impression that, well, after this life, everybody has a chance to make the right decision and blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't right. think that's because of your descriptions of near death experiences. I don't actually think that's what you're advocating for, uh, a, a post death sort of opportunity, but because you're saying that these are special, unique situations that aren't the fullness of heaven that aren't, you know, okay, stamped to your in, you know, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a window. God gives the, these particular people before sending them back to offer witness and testimony for all of our sex. For, yeah. For all. Of yeah. Us. And one of the things that held me up writing for a long time is, you know, I, I am a, an intense student of the Bible. I mean, if you read, you'll yes, see it. You are. Yeah. And I have been, it's been two obsessions, Yeah, you know, which is just bizarre. Like I, I, I mean, I think it's weird, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, I never set out to do this. Yeah. Well, I didn't, um, but it's God's way, you know? Sure. And, and, and so Hebrews uh, nine twenty seven says it's appointed for mankind to die once then comes a judgment uh-huh. that always tripped me up. It's like, okay, well, then what are these things? I, I didn't get it. And it wasn't until one people started coming forth. Initially they didn't come forth about hellish experiences uh-huh. cause I mean, who wants to say, Hey, I didn't yeah. go to the good place, <laughs> right. you know, like I'm, I'm that bad. Hey, you know, no. And, and, and it's so real. They have PTSD over yeah. it. So it, it's not a laughing matter. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, that's not their eternity. I, I have three Christian pastor friends who all had hellish NDEs mm. and came back and realized, man, I got to pursue God. And they did a wholeheartedly. Wow. But it wasn't the hellish experience that motivated them to pursue God. It was that they called out to him and he rescued them. Uh And it was his love that compelled them. They wanted people to know this is real and don't reject God because there's only one place where God stays out. If you don't want God, there's only one place where his light and love and life are not. And that is hell. Mm -hmm. And you know, as C.S. Lewis says, uh, Hell, the, the gates of hell are locked from the inside. Yeah. Hell is, is God giving free will creatures what they want when they say, stay out of my life. Uh huh. But the other side of it is that, um, well, you were, you were asking me specifically about, about criticisms and things y- people push back against and yeah. And, um, okay. So you know, this is not eternity. And I think that's a very, Uh very important distinction that, um, and I think we're just discovering all this. 
Yeah. You know, God hasn't revealed everything to us. De- Deuteronomy 29, 29, God, you know, Moses says the things, the, uh, the things, uh, the mysteries are, are the things of the law are revealed to us and to our children, mm. but the mysteries of God are not. Right. So there are things that we don't know still. So what are these? What's the purpose of these experiences in your view? Well, I do think they are a testimony to the reality of heaven, of hell, of the wonders of God. I think God is giving some people a peek into all of it. Yeah. Um, but here's the difference. And I, I don't know completely how to sort it all out in my mind. Sure. I haven't been there. Sure. I'm just listening to all these stories and trying to put the pieces together. But another commonality of near-death experiences is they would say there's a border or a boundary and it looks different to different experiences, Uh but they, they, they would say, I knew I couldn't cross over that and still come back to earth. And in imagine the God of heaven, several times I, I report on Jesus told them, you have to go back. You haven't died yet. Now they had died by our clinical definition. They had no heartbeat, no brainwaves. And so whatever this is, it's something in between when we cross over into eternal life Uh or as the scripture says, eternal death. Yeah. And that is also why I don't encourage people to go just study near death experiences to understand what's going to happen after this life. Mm -hmm. Because one, they're interpreting and they can, their interpretation can be wrong. Sure. There are a lot of people have very shallow experiences and I, I don't mean they're shallow. I mean, no, yeah. I mean, they, maybe they leave their body. They feel great. They have 50 senses, not five. They see this, you know, wonderful welcoming committee there. And then they're back in their body. Right now, you know, that, that was actually the experience of a atheist college professor who, if he had been brought back right then, he would have said, Oh, atheists go to heaven. It's all great. Sure. But that wasn't the end of, the, of what he experienced. These wonderful people then deceived him and led him into the outer darkness and mauled him. Oh my gosh. Till he turns and cries out to Jesus. And then this Jesus, he mocked and ridiculed his whole life comes to him as this brilliant light and takes him out. And then he comes back and leaves a tenured professorship two years later to become a Christian pastor and his (laughs) wife and his wife divorces him because she's an atheist and thinks he's crazy. Wow. What can motivate that? You know, only and it, it, yeah. well, and it's that kind of stuff. But but the the point is that um, these are not crossing over into eternity. You know, the scripture says there's only one yeah. who has really been there and come back to tell, and that's Jesus. Right. And so I think these are gifts from God. He's he's giving them a glimpse. Uh-huh. And now I I would also say about the you know the last minute opportunity. I don't know when the last minute is. Yeah. I do think when people cross over into eternity, you know, Jesus said there's a separation that can't be crossed. Uh So I don't think that people can, you know, realize, oh, I was wrong. Yeah. Completely on the other side. On the other hand, God's mercy and love for every person is so great that I'm convinced he is pursuing them doggedly to the very last second. Yep. Sure. And many people who had near death experiences, you heard two of them today, Mm -hmm. um, who realized as they were leaving their body, Oh my gosh, this, all this stuff is real. And they realized, you know, I'm sorry, Lord, I, I have denied you. I've, I've, and they repent. Yeah. Well, I, and, and I think he's, he's given them every last opportunity. Right. And if we are to believe the NDE's experiences about um, Jesus saying things like you haven't died yet, <laughs> then the whole question is up for debate about whether or not it's a pre-death conversion or a post-death one in that in between space. You know, I know we're sort of being um, sort of conceptual here and in, in high level, but, but still it's. I think there's wh- some kind of tie still to our temporal existence. And I don't understand that. Yeah. I but don't I think know there is. what to make of it all either, whether we get another chance after or whatever people that never believe, never knew the name of Jesus. What do they get? A well, chance? here's, but here's like, the thing I have seen yeah. is that I have heard so many stories of like, you know, it's one story of Ian, his young surfer and he's, he's, he got bit by 
multiple box jellyfish. One of them will kill you. Yeah. And he's in this ambulance and the poison is going through his body and he's realizing I'm dying. He has a life review flash of his life. And he's going, Oh, I, that's, I've heard that's what happens when you die. And, and then he hears the voice of his mom, the vision of his mom saying, pray to God, you know, no matter what state you're in, she used to tell him no matter what you've done, Ian, God will forgive you. Just pray to him. And he has this thought like, well, who's God? What God, you know, is it Buddha or Kali or, you know, all the, all the gods he had. And then he realized, well, my mom prayed to Jesus. And, and so he's like, what do I pray? And long story short, his mom at that very second was in New Zealand. He's in Mauritius. Yeah. She awakens from a vivid dream telling her pray for Ian. He's in trouble. Mm-hmm. And she's down on her knees praying for him mm-hmm. at that very moment. How does God work it? I don't know. But yeah. I have seen so many people that God is doing everything possible yeah. to, to get him to turn to him from to the very last Way second. Way too many uh, examples to ignore. And when people ask me whether you know people get another chance after this life on earth, I God is God. It's up to him. And I'm not going to argue with him, right? Oh, whatever the case. But I hope. Well, you know, some, I, I sometimes, sometimes I find Christians are, are more worried about who's not going to get there <laughs> than worried about trying to help people get there. Yeah. And I don't get that, honestly. Yeah. It's like, look, Jesus told a parable. And I think if you feel that way, I think this one's for you probably. <laughs> and his parable was, you know, and this is God, hired these workers to work in his field. Mm. And some he offered, you know, $5 of wages to, and they worked all day long and others came halfway at lunch and he offered $5 of wages and they worked half a day and others came like one minute (laughs) before closing, before closing. (laughs) And he gave them $5 and the the others came up and said, that's not fair. And he said, Hey, wasn't it fair that I offered you this wages? Yep. And if I want to be gracious, is that a problem with you? <laughs> My favorite parable. Yeah. Parable of vineyard workers, Matthew 20. Too good. That's a great place to, to, to end. Final question. Um, what do these NDEs um, tell us about what this life means and what we're supposed to be doing here? Yeah, I think that's very clear. Um, this life is all about love. It's about learning to love freely forever. And why I say that is, you know, the Bible tells us that we are living in the knowledge of good and evil in heaven. We're going to live just in the knowledge of good. Yeah. But there's still free will. The angels could rebel. Some did. Yeah, sure. And, and so I believe that God has temporarily put us in a taste of heaven and a taste of hell, just a taste. I mean, we think the suffering is horrible or we think the joys are great. Neither are even close. Uh huh. It's just a muted taste so that we will see what is missing is God. Wow. You know, he's not completely missing. He's holding back evil. His Holy Spirit is convicting of sure. r- sin and judgment and righteousness, as yeah. it says. And, but, but, and all his good gifts of love and joy and enjoyment, those are his gifts. And he's wooing us to himself, but he wants us to love him and follow him and correlate it correlating directly with that is how we love and treat one another. Yeah. And this is what Jesus said. You know, you can sum up all the commandments, the first and greatest love God with all you've got. Yeah. And the second, which can't be taken away is love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Do those two and you fulfill all the commandments of scripture. And I think that's what we are learning to do here. Mm. And so for those who haven't given their heart to God, that's the first step because you can't love God if you don't accept this incredible gift he's given through Christ that yeah. he has paid for all your wrongs. And why did he do that? We did that because he wants us in relationship Yeah. and, and he's got to be just though. Sure. And, and you're not going to, you're not going to make up for all those wrongs of the past. You can't go back in the past, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and so what he does is he pays for it so that simply a heart turning back to him can be reconnected because the problem in life is we're disconnected from the source Uh of love and life. And then we walk through life with him, hopefully becoming more like him so that his love spreads through us 
to others. That's how, that's why Jesus taught us to pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But how does that happen? Only through me when I'm willing. Yeah, sure. He gives us that agency. It's amazing. And, and it's also amazing how it all comes back to love. And that's what I get from your books, from when we talk, is um, love really is at the center of uh, the heart of God. It's who he is. And, um, and I, I, it, it strikes me that it is, uh, it, it is a call to um, love each other and not just love God. Like, obviously, we want to be, you know, religious about it. We love God, but, but we show that by how we take care of each other. Man, in, in an election year, well, everybody's divisive, everybody's torn apart. Like, uh, we, we, need, we need to re- remember this. <laughs> we need to remember this. Um, but the, the, the thing that really stood out is this idea of God who is, not only knows you more than anyone knows you, but he gets you gets more than you. anyone gets you. And he's for you more than anyone's for you. And even more, he enjoys you and he enjoys enjoying you. him. You know, I have two little granddaughters. I love to give them good gifts and enjoy it with them. Yeah. That gives me joy. Well, do you think I'm better, bigger, <laughs> a, 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 a more supreme being than God? Right. No. It's like all that love you have times yeah. forever. So. Oh, I could go on and on. John, we could go on and on all day. You got to get back to Austin. Yeah. I got to go do a wedding. Yeah, you do. Preacher life. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for being with us. Hey, I've loved it. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, I know you've been a blessing to so many and you've blessed us here today. So we're grateful. Well, thank you. Best of luck with the book. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.